Hi there. This is Karen B., the creator of the hottest flat earth ASMR video of all time. And you're watching Darren Wagner's series, Star Trek, from a Submariner's perspective. Darren likes to dive deep. How deep? Let's find out. There's been something that has always kind of bugged me about certain Star Trek productions, particularly The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Enterprise. We are told in dialogue and in tech manuals the sizes of these ships or structures, but the sets on the shows just don't seem to reflect those sizes, at least to me. Case in point, the recreation deck of the refit Constitution class Enterprise from Star Trek The Motion Picture. I always felt this space was too big for the ship. The spacious set was depicted twice in the film, first when Admiral Kirk briefs the crew regarding the mission, and later when Decker and Persis Kambata's legs take a little tour of the ship. For some reason, I just never bought it. Later, however, someone made some CGI models that convinced me that the space would work on such a relatively small ship as the Enterprise refit. When it came to the next generation, however, I thought the sets were too small. This ship is a behemoth, massively larger than a modern aircraft carrier and having a crew that is less than one-fifth the size. We know that the sets were the size they were because they were built on sound stages over at Paramount, but what would be the in-universe explanation? The only thing I can think of is that there were possibly machines and systems on board that took up much of the space of the ship, leaving only enough room for the spaces that we actually saw in the show. This idea, however, usually doesn't jive with the various versions of the ship's interior layout that have been presented to us over the years by the likes of Rick Sternbach, the Akutas, and Doug Drexler. Even in Star Trek Generations, the film in which the Enterprise D got the full movie treatment, we didn't see any new, large sets. The main shuttle bay, which we always knew was there, was only really shown once on the series, and only as a special effects miniature, and never as a standing set. I consider it a missed opportunity that the main shuttle bay didn't make it into Generations. Likewise with Deep Space Nine, a station that dwarfed the Enterprise-D. While the sets on this show, particularly the Promenade and the Ops platform, were among the largest sets the Berman era of Star Trek ever created for television, they still seemed kind of small to me given the overall size of the station. Legs control top pantyhose with feel free control. Legs control top helps me look firmer in the right places, smoother in the right clothes. Feel free control lets me feel free as a genie can be. Legs control top because nothing beats a great pair of legs. Nothing beats a great pair of legs. Then we come to Star Trek Enterprise, which featured the smallest starship named Enterprise in the franchise. To prep for this show, Berman and Braga, the producers, toured a nuclear submarine. The evidence of this was readily apparent to me when I watched the show, for the, from the uniforms to the bright work to the grad bars everywhere. Captain Archer's ready room was small, and he had to duck under a beam when getting in and out of his desk. But when we watched it, something was nagging me. The sets seemed too big for a ship that was supposed to be so much smaller than even Kirk's Enterprise. Even accounting for the room needed to stick cameras and film crews in, in terms of continuity, the passageways seemed just a little bit too big, along with the bridge. I also didn't buy that the crew had their own quarters in the form of two-man rooms, single-man rooms for the officers, and just figured that there would be an open bay berthing compartment on the ship, especially since we know that the Excelsior later had one. The only space on NX-01 that I thought seemed perfect was the engine room, or engineering, which was clearly designed with submarine philosophy. The equipment is primary, while the room for the crew is secondary. I based all of these opinions on the idea that the NX-01's saucer was about the same length as my submarine, the USS Trepang. 
But thanks to some help from Metaball Studios, however, and by the way, check out their channel here on YouTube, I began to see the NX-01 differently. I knew it was bigger than Trepang, but I didn't realize just how much bigger. Trepang wasn't even as big as one of the NX-01's nacelles. The saucer is gigantic when compared to the Trepang. It's almost the same contrast that we saw earlier when comparing the Enterprise D with an aircraft carrier. Trepang had a crew of anywhere between 90 to 110, depending on the type of deployment, while the nx ones crew was stated as being only 83, even accounting for the machinery on board. The crew of the nx one had a lot more space. Staring at this animation, I realized that none of the sets on Enterprise were in any way too big. Size comparison images and animations like this are fun because they help us better visualize the size of familiar fantasy places and vehicles. For me, I don't really understand the size of a fictional craft unless I can directly compare it with something that I'm familiar with, like my old boat. In the future, look for more videos like this one, where I compare the size of various Star Trek and other fantasy vehicles to the USS Trepang, a Sturgeon-class nuclear submarine with whom I was intimately familiar with in the 1990s, right up until the moment of her decommissioning. If you'd like to support this channel, feel free to like, share, and subscribe, and also consider buying a copy of my book, Captain Steel and Other Stories, on Amazon. A link will be in the description. Thank you for watching.